A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, it is a period of economic stability. A collection of young slackers and dreamers are all working at an independent music store, preparing for the arrival of an aging celebrity and talking about their lives. These conversations cover the nature of music, finances, dreams, expectations, and also things that require content warnings, such as suicide and suicidal ideation, drug use, and sexual relationships. As such, this podcast may not be suitable for all listeners. Welcome back to Six Degrees of Star Wars, the podcast where we celebrate and mourn the cultural presence of the Star Wars franchise. I'm your host, Sam Marcioni. Joining me today is my friend River. Hi, hi. And my friend Ellie McConaughey. Hello. And as you may remember from our previous episode, the Chance Cube, in its infinite wisdom, rolled a six. This means we are watching a movie which either features somebody who appeared in a degree one or degree five, or is a co-star of degrees two through four. And in this case, that means Empire Records, which is actually a degree six through both degree two and degree four, because it features among its cast both Renee Zellweger, who appeared with Ewan McGregor in Down With Love, and Liv Tyler, who appeared in Lord of the Rings with Dominic Monaghan. So... This was my first time seeing Empire Records. Was that true for the two of you? No, correct? Um, no. Yeah, I, I saw it back in like 2015, I think was my first go around. Yeah. I saw it my freshman year of university, so 2019. Oh, I'm so old. <laughs> that gratifies me a little bit to know River saw it earlier in the stages of life than I did because... My freshman year of college was five, eight years. Oh God, I'm old. I'm old. I, I mean, too. technically, <laughs> technically, my I, I'm graduating this year from college, but also I had to drop out until like four years ago. So, freshman, oh, what would it count as freshman year of college I'm, was like two thousand nine. Oh. Mm. <laughs> yeah, welcome welcome to the, the magic spell that is uh, power word age. It's going to happen a good handful of times so long as I'm a guest. <laughs> no, but it's really... It's... But the unifying pact here is that basically none of us are the target demographic for this movie. Well, that's, that's what I was going to say. Like, what's interesting is I think I'm the only one who was alive when it came out. Yeah, I, I was like five years old when it came out. So I was not like its target demographic... I wouldn't be alive for another six years. But even, ouch, even though I wasn't, like, around for it when it came out, I watched it in, like, 2015, and I repeat this this when I watched it this morning. Um, like, oh my god, this is, this is a clerk's knockoff. It's a clerk's knock. Like, I could tell instantly what it was aiming to be. I also haven't seen Clerks, so I will have to take your word for it. Surprise, half the point of this podcast is just to make me watch stuff that I should have watched a long I'm, time you're ago. You're going to make me make this podcast get weird. I mean, for 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 the for the Clerks knockoff, I would say yes and no. It's a lot more endearing than Clerks is, mm. and I I attribute I attribute that to the the slightly bigger cast. I don't agree. It feels a lot less "quote unquote" man painy than Clerks does at its worst moments. Um, I, I I get the comparison and I totally get it, but I I would take Empire maybe not over Clerks, but if someone gave me the option and I couldn't say go see a third movie, um, <laughs> I I would probably I think say Empire. I'm just realizing now this is the second time in a row that Clerks has been invoked. Well, Clerk, well because. <laughs> I, you know, Kevin Smith is what? A 50-year-old man at this point. And I'm still not 100% positive he hasn't watched a non-Star Wars movie. Let's get real. <laughs> that was mean. That felt mean. I mean... I'm, I'm not wrong, The though. only Kevin Smith movie I've really watched is Dogma. And I, Dogma has its problems, but I, I, I like, like Dogma. it. I like Dogma. I do like Clerks. I think there's something about Clerks where I agree that it's kind of man painy, And there's a lot wrong with the writing and a lot wrong with the directing. But, like, it's at that point where it's amateur enough that I'm, like, I can I can vibe with it. I can vibe with it because it's clearly, like, some dude shooting a movie with his friends. I, I don't necessarily... I think that the... I, so I, I'm going to get it out on the floor. I don't like this movie at all. Um, and that... <laughs> I, I've known this since I, since I saw it the first time because I love Liv Tyler. I love Liv Tyler, too. I do have a big complaint about Liv Tyler. And it's not just in this movie... It's in almost everything she's ever been in, 
Why do the sound mixers never turn up her audio track? It is so hard to hear Liv Tyler. And she has a very nice, a voice, very nice voice. But she's always so quiet. Oh, what I was going to say is, like, I do agree that Kev- that that Clerks is more man painy, But it also feels a lot less, like, wish fulfillment-y. Oh, my God. There were multiple points during this movie where I was, A, asking... How old are these characters again? And also, ew, ew, right, ew. Right, that's sort of my point. Like, at the end of Clerks, uh, spoiler, Sam. I'm sure I will forget it by the time Clerks inevitably comes up on this podcast. At the end of Clerks, like, he realized, like, oh man, I love this girl who I've been treating like shit the whole time. And she's like, no, I'm not dealing with you anymore. Go away. Which Good I think is her. a little more mature than this movie is. I don't know. Maybe. D- oh, God. Yeah, this movie is... At least for AG and Corey, it is full on nice guy wish fulfillment. I'm like, oh god, I hope the mass holes in Boston and Cambridge eat you alive on the (laughs) tee. I live in Boston. Uh. (laughs) Um. Okay, but I guess I'm. I will be in the minority of. Uh, I fully aware this movie has problems. However, what you your wish fulfillment claim as being a negative, I view as a pseudo positive. I suppose. Um, because, like, for me, this is... The, okay, so for Cotton, it's the first time I ever watched this movie. Freshman year, of high, freshman year of college, I should say. I was doing it on a, like... I was on, like, a three-movie three, three movie binge that day, which I, I do sometimes. I don't recommend it. Multiple movies in one sitting is not a way to consume media. Uh, but I think it was maybe a double feature I did with Rebel Without a Cause... Hmm. Which is a hell of a that double a very feature. Very odd double feature. <laughs> Watching Empire Records, my my general like takeaway from it was I didn't mind spending an hour in this world. In smarter hands, it would have been a hell of a lot better. And I think in smarter hands, it's not a movie, but a pilot to a TV series. Mm. As far as like the vibe movie goes, it's not a bad vibes movie. Like, I don't care about the plot. I care about the little vignettes of, like, watching these group of teenagers work in this record store and their pseudo-abusive dad figure, I guess. I don't know, that dude... That dude has a lot more patience than I would, like... Oh my <laughs> god, Joe has the patience of a goddamn saint. I would have been, like, screaming at I Lucas. Gonna... I was like, what are you doing, movie? You're making me root for the capitalist. And then I'm like, wait, it's a small business. I'm allowed to root for, for this because we're standing up to the evil... Uh, Corporate What overlords. is it? Music Town or whatever. Which, I, and then, yeah, you're, you're like, HMV I was say, like, it's a Tower Records reference. Let's be real. And then I was just like, oh my god, in ten years this building will totally be a Barnes and Noble. Yeah, I, I I was one of my main thoughts on it is I want to beat Lucas to death with a hammer. Again, I'm being overly mean. Now, I will say, River, like, I'm aware that as a media consumer in general and as a film and TV critic in particular, I am kind of an iconoclast. Um you know what what's the the my running joke is that like the best you go on rotten tomatoes what are you looking for you're looking for something with a 90 percent critical rating and a 30 percent audience rating that's the sweet spot baby um but i will also like the 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 amount of wrong you have to be about a movie um for me to tell <laughs> someone like no your opinion is wrong and not just like i'm that's not what i think is is so hot like the last time i can think i did it was like six weeks ago when a guy told me he thought portrait of a lady on fire was a metaphor for two dudes going to war like no you're just wrong about that but that's like the level (laughs) that's like the level of how bad you like i don't i don't think that i like this movie as a bad opinion it's just like i i think you have to see it at a certain point in order for it to click with you uh, and Harold, I think that they're you, like, I think if I saw Clerks, I love Clerks because I saw Clerks when I was sixteen, and I kind of felt like that. Only with more gender dysphoria. Um, but if I think that if I saw Clerks as an adult, I'd want, I'd hate Dante. I'd want him yeah. to shut up and die forever, which is what how I feel about all of Kevin Smith's modern movies. So that's my evidence for that. So I think that if you saw it at a point where it clicked with you, that's that's really important for vibes movies. You have to get into the vibes. Yeah, this I would say the sweet spot for this movie would be um like summer before freshman year of college or 
fall of se- or like spring of senior year of high school. I think th- that like or to like when I saw it, which was like fall of freshman year of university. I think that's the sweet spot for like modern audience, modern audience appreciation. River, my camera's not on, but I want you to know that every time you call college university, I'm doing the far quad point with Canadian written underneath <laughs> me. <laughs> Because, okay, because in, in Canada, it is a genuine distinction. College here is a uh, is essentially like community college in the States uh, as compared to universities, which are more like accredited universities and colleges in the States. Yeah. Uh, there is a genuine, di- there is at least, at least in Ontario, there is a genuine difference, which is a fun fact. See, I in learned. the U.S., the difference between a college and a university is colleges tend not to have graduate students. <laughs> But anyway, the thing for me, the thing that came away from me with this is that the opening scene, and this was in general, it reminded me of this shop in Boston. It's called Nuggets, and it sells it sells CDs and music equipment, and it also sells DVDs. And I go there to buy DVDs for varying levels of affordable. I found some great stuff there, including, among other things, Jean Cocteau's La Belle et la Bête. Nice. And I'm like... Yes, I love this, and I need physical media because I don't trust Correct. streaming services. Thanks Correct. a lot, David Very Zaslav. <sighs> also, this is a pro-union podcast. We are recording during the writer's strike, and we stand with the WGA. I've actually decided to become um, a filthy capitalist in the last uh, 38 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> absolute, Get out. absolute nonsense. I, I didn't think um, that... No, we're putting yes. Ellie in carbonite until she changes her mind. This is this is <laughs> transphobia. Um, you just hate to see a girl boss winning. <laughs> there's a there's a similar there's a similar store in in Toronto. It's called Sonic Boom. It's it's sort of the same layout of the two story. Like it's a lot. Le- it's become a lot less CD and DVD focused and more vinyl focused and like vinyls and cassettes. And they've got eight tracks too. It's really weird. Um, but their like their first floor is like books, the new releases, the like funky trinket stuff, and like stuff for like musicians as well. This I think they sell like um, pedals and stuff for guitars. And then if you go downstairs, it's all vinyl and dvds and cds and fun fact uh this this soundtrack which is not in, completely available on any streaming service that isn't just a playlist is the last physical album i bought in a record store uh because i wanted this movie soundtrack so badly because it bangs <laughs> say nothing got, else about this movie this soundtrack it, it's got goes a good off oh, go I kind of wish that this had been like a full on jukebox musical because there were scenes when they were using the music to really great effect. And I'm like, this could have been a whole thing. And like, I'm of two minds about the whole situation on Broadway right now where so long, so much of what it's been has been movie you already know, Mm -hmm. the musical. But like, I think there are some films that would generally be good for musicals and like, I just want more musicals. I want them. Give they, them to me, they, please, please. They did recently. Give me musicals. I think they announced a musical of this. And I'm trying to remember if, like, if the joke on 30 Rock was Mystic Pizza the musical or Empire Records a musical. It was Mystic Pizza the musical because they did a whole fat phobic thing yeah. about, oh, Jenna gained weight from eating pizza on stage. Yeah, that joke wasn't great. Every night. That wasn't a great running gag. Um, no, what I was going to say is that um, it does have a rock and soundtrack, and I think that if it it has these these elements that I think I would like it more if it picked one of those elements and committed to yeah. it. Like it has these things where they're edging up to doing full on fourth wall breaks, which is where I think that I see the other movie that it really reminds me of oh. is High Fidelity. It really reminds me of High Fidelity. Um, yeah, and like they have the high oh, fidelity high record fidelity. sign. That movie makes me want to die. There. And it's like I was like, there's not enough fourth wall breaking to justify the fourth wall breaking. Right, and that's what I I mean. I'm not a huge fan of high fidelity either. I like it more than Empire Records, but it's not like I know. Dude, there's a there's a brand of dude who makes high fidelity their whole personality. Well, that's the better than the mm-hmm. brand of dude who makes Fight Club their whole personality. Still not a great brand of dude. 
High Fidelity is one of those movies I, I I stopped watching in the middle of and said, absolutely the fuck not. I think it's, I can't tell if it's I hate John Cusack's acting style or I could not stand the plot. Um, it is entirely possible a combination of both because I think I've walked, I think I've stopped watching two John Cusack movies and I, that's not enough to make a pattern, but it is enough to like poke a corner of my brain and be like, for, hmm. For um, I think this movie... And High Fidelity, they're brushing up against this. It's really hard, I think, to make a good movie about music that doesn't make you come off like the most pretentious and obnoxious mm -hmm. kind of hipster. I have issues with the Rex Manning thing, but at the same time, I'm like, yeah, it was probably for the best that they made up this fictional pop star to be the big deal signing thing. Because, like, imagine if they had gotten Rick Astley instead. I I was going to say, I, I have no evidence of this, except, like, my gut instinct on how movies work. But my instinct tells me that they asked, like, four people, like, hey, do you want to appear in our movie as yourself? And they all said no. Um, <laughs> that I, I don't know. I don't have any evidence that that's the case. I could be 100% wrong, but I, I can taste it. I, I think I think given that this movie soundtrack has a grand total of like two or three songs people have actually heard of and then a bunch of like nineties bands, sources say probably not because they blew the I'm money gonna, on the license. Oh abs um, I, I'm gonna let you 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 two in on a secret since you weren't really around as much as I was for the nineties. There were so many Yeah, my back hurts. Um, there were so many bands and directors in the nineties. Like there's this really, really hilarious um like I don't know what, what to call it, like four vignettes movie from like ninety six, um, called Four Rooms. And the 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 core of the of the movie is that I've seen the Madonna segment of You that. have. It's very ah. it, that's probably the best one, by which I mean it's the one that's the closest to watchable. Um, which it's not. Uh, but my point is that, like, th the old, that has four directors, Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, and two people you've never heard of. And it's because there were so many, like, flash-in-the-pan indie and bands and indie directors that everyone thought was going to be the next hot shit that just disappeared. So a lot of these bands were probably bigger in 1995, or they thought they were going to be bigger in 1995, and they'd sell the sound. Is it possible to go into the multiverse where the other two directors got big and Quentin Tarantino didn't? I, I guess we can keep Robert Rodriguez, but I don't want to live in the Quentin Tarantino verse anymore. Uh, I like. I'm. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say. I don't dislike Quentin Tarantino, but I still haven't seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I think I'm kind of just, like, tired of him. But don't tell the bros that. They'll cut me open. Um, don't worry. I've already... I burned Tarantino during our last... I'm just... I'm establishing patterns already. You'll do so that. I'm about as formulaic as a George Lucas screenplay. Ew. It's like poetry. It rhymes. Uh, the other... <laughs> The, the other connection I made to a movie from, like, this time period, and that's in the very inconsistent fourth wall breaks, only this is a much better movie, is Election, which I don't know if either of you have no, seen. No, I have heard its reputation. I have not it's, seen it. It's very good. The, the key you have to get to like and appreciate it, if you ever watch it, is... All of it has four narrators, and people assume, okay, this narrator is unreliable, but the others aren't. Nope, they're all totally unreliable. They're all lying to themselves all the time. But yeah, it's a deeply unpleasant movie in a way that I think is. I, I occasionally feel like Empire Records is going for like detestable main characters, but isn't really willing to to commit to it, to making its characters truly reprehensible and punish them for it. I mean, if that's the goal, then way to go. They they made them hate me more, except for Deb. I like and Deb. I'll, I'll reiterate this. Like To talk about Deb, we need to talk about depictions of Ooh. suicide. So Yeah, we gotta talk. We gotta start content, that warning, content that. warning. Really kind of shittily written depictions of suicide, if I'm being frank. Yeah, uh. we'll, we'll put a pin in that. Uh, before we get into the dark stuff, one thing I do want to talk about is circling about back around to the idea of uh, making movie about music that doesn't make you a pretentious hipster. Mm. The smart thing they did is 
to some extent, each character has a sort of not maybe not distinct, but each character seems to have their own music taste, which they set up with the Eminem scene and the picking of the first music soundtrack and the idea that all of the characters have a once a day veto ability on the on mm-hmm. the on the in shop mm-hmm. stereo. Um, this idea that like each all of their music tastes are different enough that not all they don't always line up and that to either by their own volition or to some extent maybe joe has implemented it they have implemented this veto system of getting around the inevitable arguments that would come up with that sort of um that sort of idea and i think that's probably the thing that saves it from that quote-unquote hipsterdom is the idea that like you're not just getting, you know, kids like AJ and Mark and Lucas who probably have like super indie tastes, but you're also getting kids like Corey and uh, Gina's taste who are probably more mainstream pop. And then Deb, who's probably the reason there are at least two Cranberry songs on this record, you know. (laughs) When Corey and Gina were introduced, I was like, wait, can they be lesbians, please? No, it's Deb. It has to be Deb and Corey. Like they're, just do it. Just, that would be okay, way more. Deb and Corey, I would much prefer because when after uh, after Gina and Corey have that massive fight, and it feels like Sam Levinson watched that, I'm like, I'm gonna make euphoria about this, but like <laughs> a thousand times more. That's just so mean. But it's also correct. <laughs> uh. But anyway, I like the conversation between Corey and Deb. Because they're actually talking to each other like actual fucking people. Right. And as a screenwriter, if I'm being like totally, I'm going to write a formulaic romance in this situation. You get, you get Corey is coming down off of speed. Something which comes out of basically nowhere and it's never, so and never, and once the scene I, is over, like never comes up again. It's so good. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if it's the fact that I have, you know, seen too many teen comedies or just know the like teen archetypes that maybe have followed this film's footsteps. But the minute you introduced Corey as came into work several hours before her shift to do calculus homework from a big ass house picked up by her friend who had time to make cupcakes overnight i'm like oh she's an overachiever on speed because she cannot get, manage her parents expectations of what she is oh, and God, the minute they mentioned the she bell. was going the, yeah the minute they mentioned she was going to harvard i was like i don't know if it's like my instincts for teen com- for teen dramas and teen comedies but i looked at the, her i looked at Corey and i'm like yeah of course that's some sort of you know drug of course i'm not drugs. saying that it's not like it doesn't make sense it makes 100 percent sense in the logic of the movie i just feel like the scene before it happens she you see her popping pills like two times or maybe that's just because i i watched this on youtube it's free on youtube with ads yeah and i think that's the extended cut um because it's 40 it's like 15 yeah, minutes like, long. it's like 15 minutes longer three than cuts the of this movie oh my god um, but what there's was... three cuts of this movie. There's the but... original theatrical. There's a 2003 version that adds scenes but cuts some fan favorites. Then there's a third version that came out in like 2013. That's the original. Like it's called the remixed version, which is the original cut of the movie plus the added scenes without any of the like fan favorite moments cut out. I guess. Guy, um, guy thinks so he's I Francis think Francis Ford Coppola. Yeah, but like. <laughs> there, that it was not good build up. Like mm-hmm. it would have made oh, more no, sense. Absolutely if seen not. Corey like popping throughout the day. No, I th- again, I think this this leads into my idea that like this is not quite a perfect movie, but it is a pretty spectacular potential pilot. Because mm. um, mm. I was thinking about that as I was wandering around, you know, doing my doing my life today. Um, <laughs> is I would kill like. I, I have been sitting on a, a theoretical urban fantasy pitch that whenever I try to pitch it to people, I jokingly say, it's Empire Records, but urban fantasy. And I think that's because Ur- Empire Records is a great pilot. Mm-hmm. Maybe not a great pilot, it's, it, 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 but it, it feels like it's the middle, it's the season finale of a three episodes, of a three season television series that we have found a lost episode of. Um, I guess. because you you walk into all of these really well-established dynamics 
that don't really seriously change by the end of this end of the episodes but you get like the thing like oh yeah the shop is going under which feels like a culmination of a season-long arc that joe has been hiding from everybody since you know episode one and has finally come to the head you know the fact that we open in media res with lucas closing up shop is this like big you know accomplishment that feels like the culmination of an arc that has been going on for a season and a half um, like, you know that it's the beginning of the movie, so he can't win at all. But, like, god damn it, Lucas. Yeah, I know. Lucas, you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 my, my favorite joke is that I, when I was looking it up on, on Google to figure out, you know, where the, where the hell to watch the movie, um, I, it was like, oh yeah, this, this, this place is set in Delaware. And I was like, okay. And then they're like, he's driving to Atlantic City on a motorcycle? I had to pull up Google Maps to figure out how long that drive that's was. Not, that's not, that's not, that's like... like <laughs> I, it's I, two out. It's like two hours and a couple of minutes. But I was like, "Why would you do it on a motorcycle?" I, I was saying uh, when I over Passover, I was in Ocean City, which, if those of you who don't know, New Jersey is like right. You, you can see Atlantic City from the boardwalk on Ocean City, and De- you could. And if you go down to the other end of the boardwalk, you can see Delaware. So you know it's not that far. <laughs> what I was going to say about Corey and what's the goth chick's name? Deb, 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 Deb is like there's that scene right after Corey comes down off her speed high and like Deb is taking care of her and they have that conversation where like do you really want your first time to be it here you know making jokes about that I'm like it it would this scene would 100% work if Corey was like yeah with you bam they're fucking <laughs> you know I'm right you know I'm right the screenwriter and you knows that I'm I right I wouldn't be opposed to that but if that were gonna happen it would have to be a situation where we don't see it because again i'm just i could not stop being like these are children Liv tyler Tyler is 20 is like 25 at this point i don't care they're written as teenagers it's still freaking weird to me it doesn't even matter that Liv tyler is infinitely older than i am currently not infinitely currently i get it at, at, at that point in the movie, I would argue that Corey is a little too repressed to smash cut to banging banging the work the break room, um, or like the kitchenette, I guess, because technically that whole back area is the quote unquote break room. Uh, which, by the way, the layout of the shop makes no sense, but I am obsessed with it on like a <laughs> set level. I am obsessed with the set design in this movie, if nothing else. I um, I do. Uh, speaking of Corey, my last thought on her arc, because her arc's really inconsistent, because it kind of exists for her to get together with um AJ, the nothing AJ. guy. The nothing guy. Um, there's the guy. Most I of them are nothing guys. I had so much trouble so, getting all their so names like, straight. Lucas, Lucas is a dick. A dick. I hate Lucas. And um, AJ's kind of pretentious, but I actually liked the like completely laid back dude who had no arc because he is very realistic. He doesn't really care about this. Why would he? It's a minimum wage job at a retail. But what I, what I was gonna say is that I like I really yeah the guy who wants to start the band that's him. Yeah, um, Mark. What I really liked about Corey's subplot is you expect the the singer who like rejects her or like he doesn't directly reject her, but he basically does something that I think he knows is going to drive her off instantly and then sleeps with her friend. I You know, you expect movie convention says he's going to get some big comeuppance or he's going to change his way. He doesn't care. He just walks out. He's like, whatever. I'm still rich. Bye. Like, that felt kind of, like, grounded and human that he doesn't actually care what these people think of him. The His yeah. manager quitting to date Joe, on the other hand. That was more like... They decided Joe needs a win before we give him the final win of somehow being able to buy real estate with nine thousand dollars. Like that's how you God, know this 90s is the nineties. One second, one second. Nine thousand dollars in nineteen ninety five is worth today. Uh, that is eighteen thousand dollars. So, yeah, you like, can't buy. I can't put a down payment on a house for like. 40k but also also i would consider i would consider the fact that mitchell is probably selling it to him at a bargain price because he just wants it gone well yeah but he was still gonna buy in a partnership with nine thousand dollars which would suggest that the house I would, was so again the, i think that i think that falls under the we're walking into a season finale for a television series that's already been running for three seasons because i imagine that nine thousand was just the last 
bit of payment. Yeah, or uh, something that like getting that. getting poured into like a, a lump sum that had been building up and that 9000 was just like the last payment <laughs> before that's everything settled that's one of those things that doesn't get communicated super well like i can't tell if that was all of the money that he was saving up for this or if it was like something else it, but you know i get I, I will save this in the movie's favor it's not it's not communicated super well but it doesn't really need to be like you get this is an important matter. money this is this money is important there i've got it i don't need because more. i'm never going to be able to do it <laughs> exactly uh, insert, the John Oliver jo- insert the yep. John Oliver joke about the HOA, uh, oh, and if you're God. under the age of 35, you can't watch Just the HOA Just go watch this thing out. on Chuck E. Cheese instead. I, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. I am going to be a human rights lawyer, so I'm, I will be totally set for property, because I'm going to get shot by a third world government when I'm 41. Who needs to buy property? No, but um, I think... God, brain, brain, come back to me. Okay, yeah. So the thing about the thing about Empire Records uh, is like there are like maybe seven plots spinning at any given point in time, and you really only need to care about maybe two of them. Yeah, that is um, th- that is the thing that I think allowed it to become a cult classic. Like I don't like it, but I get why people do because if mm-hmm. you vibe enough with one of the characters, and they aren't they aren't all the same character. Um. If you vibe enough with one of the characters, like if you are, if you vibe with Deb or if you vibe with Corey or if you vibe with AJ, I guess, um, then you, you, you will like the movie and just sort of quiet. And the rest of the stuff is inoffensive enough that you can sort of quiet Deb's weird stuff aside that you can just sort of quietly tune it out. Um, I think... I think for me, it's less a case of, like, vibing with the specific characters and more, again, like, vibing with the space. Mm-hmm. Like, this record store and the culture this odd collection of losers has created to make this record store maybe not, like, the most fulfilling job they ever have, but mm. the one that is going to make sure that they got through high school a modicum of a live. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... I think that's I think that's ultimately why I am a lot more maybe not sympathetic to it but more again to lean into it a bit more is I am perfectly content with this movie being not even about the plot aspects or the Rex Manning Day stuff or even about the money I am content for the little moments like the little montage sequences of these kids just working in this shop mm-hmm. and having their little quirky arguments with each other that are clearly long standing, um, having, you know, mosh pits in the store because a one really good song came on that was perfect for it. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, sort of all of their little trinkets and aspects that make it feel like to some extent they've all slept here at least once. Like you get the general feeling yeah. that one of these kids has crashed on that, ca- on that stupid ass leopard print couch for an extended period of time. The fact that Gina has a bit about shoplifters. The fact that Mark has a whole strategy about how to chase them around the store effectively. The shoplifting thing. I just, oh God. I was fine with it right up until the point where the gun thing happened. Because yeah, I, like yeah. I know it was the '90s back then, but like, this was pre-Columbine, even. pre-Columbine, yeah. pre everything, and now we're like on a weekly basis of the Onion article. No way to prevent this happening, says only country in the world where this happens regularly. That, that is one of those yeah, things about like, the movie that has aged like milk. Um, and I, I do definitely get what you're saying, River. I wish that was I wish that they'd actually cut the plot out. Like if you cut out um I I like hangout movies and I do admit that this place that like it does a fairly good job of like I compared it to Clerks. And one of the main differences I'd say is that Clerks the the store that he works at is so explicitly intended as a hell that he will never escape from that he's just named Dante. Like it's not even subtle. Whereas I think yeah. this does do a good job of making it seem like a place that these these kids are happy to work at. Yeah, like you again, I joking I joked about Joe being the sort of like pseudo abusive parental figure, 
but like his check-in with deb when she's like in one of the listening booths just doing the taxes mm-hmm. i don't even know if they're her taxes or the shop's taxes either answer is immensely funny uh, you probably like, you probably should not have a high her, schooler doing your taxes probably not um especially one who who needs to be in therapy so i guess that that's a good point to bring it back to debbie yeah yeah Best character in the movie. She, she's the best character in the movie because we are very much left. I, I don't know how to put this in a way that doesn't sound mean. So I'm just going to dive in because I'm going to sound meaner than I mean to be. She is the best character in the movie because we don't get a lot of details about where she's at. So we can figure them out. We, like, so he, she almost becomes like a puzzle. Like you're trying to figure out what her relationship is with this guy and with that girl and why they don't like each other. And, with Debbie, they use show don't tell way more than with the other characters. Like the other characters are laying out their baggage, honestly, way too much. And I think the worst offense there is Gina, where they're like, "Oh, look at Gina. Gina's a slut. Gina will sleep with anybody." And they give Corey an entire speech about why Gina's so freaking cool. And I'm like, "You're way overdoing it." And also, I'm still concerned that Gina just had sex with a man probably old enough to be her father, and I'm not entirely sure whether or not she's underage. Yeah, put a pin in it. Uh, I think I think in the case of Deb, the the strongest instinct I have with Deb is what also really solidifies the idea that as much as these kids have been bickering up until this point, like, you know... Age, the boys have the I think it's 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 one of the things that blurs the the quote unquote gender lines because the per, first people to check in on Deb are not Corey, they're not Gina. It's it's AJ and Mark and Lucas who notice that something like granted they are the first people to see her come in, but AJ's the one who makes the most dedicated effort to be like clearly something tr- fucking horrific has happened. And I want to assure you that your existence here is valued. Like, he's the one who starts up the dance in the shop to try and, like, make her feel better. And yeah, maybe it is a little misguided, but it feels less like a less like a nice guy move and more of a, this is a person who I have spent enormous amounts of time with and I didn't realize I almost lost them. And I think, you know, like, there is that sort of, like to not get into my own personal shit coming to work the day after a suicide attempt takes some cojones and takes some like major fucking energy and i think that like the fact that deb is so pulled together is as much as she is allowing herself to be in that moment you know given what we don't fully understand about her because again convinced this is not a full movie uh, but rather a season finale um, but listen, I will, I will argue that point until the day I die. Um, cause the more I talk about it, the more I feel I'm right. Um, but like you get the general sense that like, if we had come in at any other point, we might've gotten a different version of her. But the day, the fact that we are entering this movie with her the day after an attempt and the fact that the people who reach out to her are not the girls, but the guys. I think that's maybe, I don't know. I think that's really sweet. And I I can't tell if that's just me being a sucker for this, you know, weird a cast of losers. But I think it's, I think it's nice. I think it's nice. I don't know, man. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's indicative of a level of sexism in the screenplay, the same way it's like gross, the way they keep looking at the girls' bodies. But it's also like, Oh, the girls are catty and mean, and they like talking about boys and having sex with Rex Manning, and it takes Corey having a freaking meltdown to actually have a real conversation. If I got mad at every single instance of sexism in movies, I would never watch a movie or piece of media ever again, and I would drive myself yeah, insane. Yeah, fair. So that's, that's I, fair. I, I, I'm not... I don't want to say that I'm more forgiving of this for that, but I have to, like, whenever that sort of happens and I feel myself getting, like, squidgy about it, I have to clock myself being like, right, 90s, we knew better, but we weren't knowing better and we weren't doing better. So, one thing I'm going to say, and this oh. is not a, this is not intended as a, as an apology or a slam, merely an observation, is that, 
Um, the director of this movie does not seem to be a very um, a very complicated director. His best movie is probably Pump Up the Volume, which is not a very good movie. Although, two notes I will note from his filmography. One, he acted in David Cronenberg's first feature film. And he has a TV oh. movie called Jailbait, which does not have a Wikipedia entry. Um, is, oh boy! Is pump, hang on, I don't pump up the volume. I want to know what it is. That's the pump Christian the Slater movie. Is that the Christian Slater? That is yes. Uh, Radio Rebel knockoff it, movie. It is. Oh god. So the 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 end of my point there is that if you're, it, especially if you're a man, and especially if you're a cis straight man, you exist so immersed in the the male gaze that is um that permeates every aspect of our visual culture that it is incredibly difficult to not just sort of monkey see monkey do your way into replicating it unless you're being incredibly thoughtful about not replicating it and i don't think this dude's an incredibly thoughtful filmmaker so i just don't think he thought about directing it in a way that that viewed the the actresses as objects yeah, this this was a '90s movie made in 30 days. <laughs> what I was gonna say is that, like, I I I was so expecting there to be some level of humanity between Meg and the other women in the store, and it's so like up until Meg. No, is it Meg? Deb. Deb. Um, I don't know. It's a three-letter name has an E in the middle. <laughs> um, I don't know where I got Meg from. Leave me alone. That I just um. I've totally lost my voice training at this point in this in the conversation. Uh, that I, it's so not, it's so not there. And I I think that honestly, I never like never any time I've seen this movie have I been able to get over Gina mocking someone she knows tried tried to kill herself to her face, um, about it and like like Gina as a character. I'm just like, nope, you are. You are done. Gina is a terrible you person. You get to leave. You are never, I will kill you the next time I see you. Go to the Cook County Jail, Gina. Go be upstaged by Catherine Zeta-Jones. Gina has a specific flavor of absolutely not. Um, but I also just don't like Renee Zellweger as an actress. That's a completely different can of worms. I, um, oh my god, that is Renee Zellweger. I, hmm. It I'm, is sure Renee you could, I'm sure you and, could give me one of the movies that she has been in that I have seen and been like, oh yeah, that she's fine. But I, she has one of those faces and one of those acting styles that every time I see her, I'm just like, I'm pretty sure you could have been played by a different actress and this movie would have gone over better. First thing um, I saw her in was Chicago and I was like, she's a terrible singer and every scene she's in makes her look like she's just sucked on a lemon. <laughs> And I watched this, I'm like, she sounds like a better singer in this than she did in Chicago. I, I think it also might just be the styling, because, like, that song is not serious in the slightest. That's the great part about most 90s pop rock or pop punk songs, is that you mm. do not have to be a great singer. You just have to have enough emotion behind it to get by. One thing I will say about Deb that is handled better than some movies, and I'm going to reference one in my comment that you'll know what movie I'm talking about, Watching her the first time I saw this movie, I was like nails in the in the armrest braced for her to get what we in the biz call the Ali Sheedy. Oh. And I am pretty okay with the fact that that didn't happen. I was totally braced. Like she's going to need a man. That man's going to make her stop being goth and it'll fix her. I'm like, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Fucking breakfast think- club. <sighs> I I, th- I, I couldn't fuck the breakfast tell if she was supposed to be goth or she, if she was just dressing that way because she thought it was sexy. I think she was. I I think she was I, a '90s male non-goth director's idea of what a goth girl looks like, and that take that what however you mean. I was gonna say she's a very specific brand of mall goth. She may not be. She may not identify herself as goth, but like her tr- stylings and her trappings just so happen to align. I don't. I was thinking about that, and I actually. Do I want... I'm not certain if I would say that that particular brand of mall goth actually existed in the real world yet. Like, I associate yeah, mall goths that's... with, like, mid-2000s emo culture. And Hot Topic back when its logo actually looked cool. 
Sure. Yeah. I will put a pin in that. I. No, I think, I'm taking that pin out and throwing it away. I'm, We're not talking about hot that's topics. Fair. You gotta stop putting pins in things, River, or I'm gonna think you're making me a dress. <laughs> I know. No, I, 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 I. That's just my way of mentally sorting things of like things to maybe come back oh, to is oh, just sticking a pin in. Oh, that. Sam, it's I know like, River pretty I, well. They're not making you a dress, they're building you a conspiracy board. <laughs> Does it at least um, come with my own Charlie Day? I will also say that my my most uncomfortable bit of this movie, as uh, the the sir, I, I, what I like to not affectionately but just sort of call the 2010 suicide scare, um, as someone who was peak teenager for that sort of like 2010 to 2013 suicide self harm tumblr scare i guess um it was a weird moment hearing deb it was a really weird moment especially being a tween teenager um hearing deb describe how she tried to kill herself i was physically like my my elbows were around my ears i was uh i i have a very big self-mutilation self self-mutilation squick so like my elbows were in my ears, my arms were like so tight to my body. I was just like, nope, 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 nope. Can we get through this scene faster? Oh God! That's that's sort of the yeah. ultimate issue I take with with Deb's storyline. Not that I think it's bad in isolation, though. As as we mentioned earlier, I would like it if it was gayer because I would like everything if it was gayer. Except you, high school. You keep doing your thing. I think there's like one straight character <laughs> in that show. League of their own, too. Like Legends, I, I think Legends could only get a little bit more gayer. My my point is, just like, I, I think that Deb's storyline is both so much heavier than the rest of the storylines in this movie, and also so much heavier than this writing can support. Um, we, we referenced Saved by the Bell and the freakout from that show, a little like way way back like when dinosaurs roamed the earth and (laughs) one of the comparisons i always make thinking of the actress who gave that freak out is when i talk about showgirls i think that one of the core problems that movie has is that the that she is giving a heavy performance that is not only completely wrong for the movie she's in it is so far beyond her ability she cannot wrangle this performance into something believable and so i think that it would have been a lot better if they'd made Deb's story a lot less heavy, made it like a bad breakup or what I, the first time I saw it, I thought that the, I don't want to call it the punchline, but I thought that the big reveal at the end would be that she put those bandages on herself and she was faking it, which was, which would be dark, but it would be dark in a way that would fit with the tone of the rest of the movie, you know, with a movie where a guy can walk in with a gun and it's okay. It was just blanks. Even like if she, I don't know, maybe had an accidental run in and that was prompting her to suicidal ideation. And then she faced that with the freaking Warren Beatty. Wait. Right. I, I, I think that it, that it's, it's. Warren would have worked so much better as a throwaway character. Warren sticks. Every time I watch this movie, I'm floored by how long Warren, who is a completely annoying character and doesn't add anything sticks around they could drop him after one scene like after he gets his picture taken and they just keep him there for the rest of the movie this movie needed a better script doctor this movie the 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 it saving gary grace fisher this, the saving grace of this movie is that the rex manning plot is not actually that important and it also breezes by if you have the fast forward button around right, right. i think um, that, that that they should have taken that energy and brought it to the rest of the storylines like Maybe cut one of them. Um, Maybe cut the guy who kept going on about records versus CDs. That's, like, that's a, I didn't even catch his name. He just, he annoyed he, me. He shows up and then leaves. Like, he's not really in the movie in any real way. My, I think that if you, like, cut one storyline, um, if I'm being honest, it's probably going to be... No, I, I like Deb's storyline. It's probably going to be AJ wants to go to art school because it's such a nothing. AJ only wants to go to art school because he thinks that's going to be something that'll let him 
stay with Corey. Yeah, the, it, get with he, he glues it, some quarters to the ground at one point. It's like that's my art. And then at the end, no, that's a prank that's done by five year olds. Right. And then at the end of the movie, Liv Tyler gives him this whole speech about how talented he is. I'm like, did I miss it? Where was it? Again, again, it's we rare. are not walking in to a movie we're walking into the finale of season three right but what i'm saying is like if they cut out one storyline and then made all of the other storylines breezier it wouldn't feel like a pilot it would actually feel more like a pilot and then that would give it i think a more i think that the best kind of a day in the life movies like like used cars is a really good example i really like used cars um is that a single day movie i think it is my point is that, like, it, it feels like there is stuff that happened before and there will be stuff that happened after. And therefore, you don't need to totally resolve everything. And maybe some stuff can remain unfinished. And you can just breeze past a lot of stuff. And I think that if they'd done that, it it's, would it's it would the, be the vibe. The that, fanfic zone. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't know anything about fanfic. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. <sighs> So basically, either Empire Records needed more plot or it needed less plot. Uh, but the amount of plot that we have is not, it's not sufficient. It's not plot. vibing with me. Um, I River likes it, and I respect that. I think again, I would much deeply prefer it as a television series, um, mostly because the end of this movie. Again, you send off AJ. You send if we if we do treat this like a, a sort of. The, the only comparison that's coming to my head is the season three of Glee, where we send the seniors off to New York, but we keep everybody else okay. still at McKinley. What? Um, I never, never. I don't want to know. I mean, I could... Smart. You're smart. You, you but keep it, saying this, and all I can think is, oh, god damn it. We're saying it, we're speaking it to an existence, I mean, and by the end of this, we're going to find out that HBO is announcing an Empire Records reboot, except... Ha ha, no we're not, because A, there's a strike, and B, David Zaslav is the I worst. I mean, I could point out that the other movie I keep comparing it to, High Fidelity, got a show where they made John Cusack's character bisexual, and then cast Zoe Kravitz, and then they cancelled it after one season. That's just the state of hell capitalism and the state of art. Um, Interesting, I'm gonna which, go walk into Long Island uh, Sound, bye. Uh, yeah, Ellie, I'm gonna go walk into Lake Ontario. No, come back. We I'm gonna go walk into Lake Ontario. In December. What? Ellie, I hope I'm wrong. Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. God damn it! I I do really want to see Bottoms. <laughs> Not enough people saw Shiva Baby. Speaking, well, I could go walk over in Long Island Sound to where uh, Shiva Baby was set. Rachel Sinat, just... if you can get bodies, bodies, bodies into this. Oh wait, Amanda I... Amanda Stenberg. She's, she's in the Hunger Games. They're in bodies. Amanda yeah. Stenberg is in the Hunger Games. Amanda Stenberg is going to be an acolyte. Mm-hmm. I um, really, I really just end. genuinely want to talk about how Rachel Sinat in Bodies, Bodies, Bodies turns the line. Your parents were upper middle class into a slur. It is a slur when she says it, and it's the line read of 2022. All right, well, we've gone far enough down this tangent train that I think the time has come to ask. Empire Records, is the force with it? Ellie? This is my first episode, so I don't know how... There is... It's a yes or no I, question. I, I know, and I'm going to be the most infuriating human on Earth and give you a not a different answer. There's, there's this... Um, other movie podcast I love called We Hate Movies. And when they're talking about whether or not they recommend a movie, sometimes they'll be like, it's not very good, but it's like a Saturday afternoon hangover movie. That is Empire Records. It is quiet. It is inoffensive. It's got a rock and soundtrack. If you can vibe with it, you'll probably love it. I did not like it. I didn't really like most of the characters. So for me, The Force was not with it. All right, River. Um, as, as it's, as it's Soul Defender and as it, well, I mean, not Soul Defender, but like, as someone who, uh, I've come to the conclusion I like more about the exterior of this film, i.e. everything I can extrapolate in my own little gay fandom brain, um, <laughs> than in the actual movie itself. I think I technically <laughs> have to say The Force is not with it, um, but its set design, its music direction, and its costume department, The Force is with it. The actual movie itself, The Force is not with it. I think that's my final verdict. Someday. Every every technical every technical person 
gets a force is with it. So, the actual movie itself, the force is so, not with someday it. Someday I'm going to talk at length about how, about like the the habit people have of not really loving a piece of media, but loving the piece of media that they're inventing in their brain while watching it. <laughs> the, it's they forgot to put the good in it. <laughs> well, I love democracy. I love the republic. And for me, Empire Records, the force is not with it. <laughs> All right, so who has things they would like to plug? Um, well, I appear on this this stream um, where we play D anD D. It's it's pretty obscure. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Uh, it's called Fantasy Worlds Elsewhere. <laughs> um, that's right. I play D anD D with both of you. How dare you forget our sunshine grump dynamic? Uh, I love it. I love. It. I play it with Sam, obviously. Uh, I do also have a Twitter <laughs> and a LSR forty two and a Tumblr football and tuxedos. At some point, the next it might be up by the time this episode goes up. Who knows? Uh, I'm doing a podcast on the Tegan and Sarah TV show High School, where me and a friend of mine named um, Katie Duffy will be reviewing every episode of the podcast of the TV show High School and the Al- Tegan and Sarah album, where the song that the episode is named after Katie is Katie is also part of Fantasy Worlds Elsewhere with us. And also plays D&D with me and River. Yeah. Good enough segue. River, anything you'd like to plug? Oh, God. See, here's the problem. Everything that I would hypothetically plug is what we like to call in pre-production. Um, between between this podcast, our friend Jazz's hypothetical uh, public domain retelling podcast, and uh, <laughs> another podcast my friend and I are, my friends and I are trying to tie ourselves down to do where we try to explain the big tentpole pop culture phenomena to each other uh, for those who did not get in on the ground floor, so to speak. Um I am also on Twitter uh, at Dreams Rebel. Uh, be prepared for a crap ton of hockey, uh, mostly about the Dallas Stars because I'm crying about the Canadian. Um, <laughs> it's not even it's like it, it'd be one thing if I were like posting about the Leafs all the time, but no, no, I'm posting about the Dallas Stars. <laughs> And you can check out my YouTube channel, La Femme Fictionale, for feminist media critiques. Find me on Patreon, Twitter, and Instagram at Femme Fictionale, and on TikTok at Fictionale Femme. To support this podcast, please subscribe to us on your platform of choice, leave reviews, and share with your friends to boost our visibility. And now, it's time to turn to the chance cube, so let's refresh ourselves on our categories. Degree 1. Non-Star Wars, but still made by George Lucas or Lucasfilm. Degree 2. Stars one of the main trio from a trilogy or the lead of a show or a standalone series. Degree three, stars a supporting cast member from multiple projects. Degree four, stars a supporting cast member from one movie or project. Degree five, made by a Star Wars crew or creative team member who is not George Lucas and also does not have any of the previous degrees. This includes composers like John Williams, directors like Ron Howard, writers like Lawrence Kasdan, sound engineers like Ben Burtt, and any other field that involves Star Wars in some way, because film is, and always has been, a collaborative effort. Degree 6 stars a co-star of Degrees 2 through 4, or appears in a Degree 1 or 5. Alright, let's roll the chance cube and see what we get. It's a six again. It is a six uh, it, it again. Is a six. And for our degree six, the next one on the docket is Akira Kurosawa's The Hidden Hell Fortress. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love the pendulum swings this podcast is going to do. It's the absolute pendulum swing of A New Hope to Empire Records to Hidden Fortress. All right, well, join us next time when we will be covering Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress. Sayonara, stay safe, and may the Force be with you. And also with you. (laughs) See (laughs) y'all.